Hello, welcome to the Thursday, February 1st, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Starting this week in the United States, the Internal Revenue Service or the IRS started accepting tax returns for the 2017 tax year. With that, the race is on between bad guys, good guys trying to get the tax return in because as well, the way it sort of works is first one to file a return for a particular social security number tends to win. The IRS tries to pay out these refunds as quickly as possible and does very little checking initially. The checking is really more done later down the road than, well, they may come and try to get their money back later. Problem is, of course, they're trying to get the money back from the honest filer, not from the one that used stolen credentials in order to file these tax returns. And of course, the bad guys don't have to wait to get all their paperwork together and they essentially just try to file a return that gives them the maximum refund. During tax filing season, we also see a number of phishing scams typically pop up. Tom has a nice example of such a phishing attack that he has seen the last couple days. Uh, now, often these phishing attacks actually don't really try to go after your personal information. They may already have that from other breaches. They're more going after, like in this case, Google passwords and the like in order to send more spam. In past years, we also have seen some more targeted attacks against accountants and the like that are trying then to again, go more after personal information. Information. Of course, many organizations have switched to electronic document delivery, so a user may not really be that suspicious to receive an email that either has a PDF attached that claims to be a tax document or that links to a website where apparently you may be able to download a tax document. Tax documents with personal information, of course, should never be sent via email. Sadly, I do see a lot of sort of public cloud services being used to exchange tax documents either by companies or by accountants that are using these cloud services in order to collect documents from their clients. And Kevin yesterday posted an article looking at uh, some of the Bitcoin mining schemes or cryptocurrency mining schemes. We of course have seen plenty of that. One thing I'm sort of a little bit personally interested in is rogue cryptocurrency mining rigs that are run in data centers. Kevin mentions here as an example use of an infrared camera in order uh, to detect some of these mining rigs. I've heard of them being hidden under desks and in one case even under a raised data center floor. If you run into anything like that and if you're able to share pictures or stories about this, uh, please uh, let me know. I would be interested in assembling some of the more creative ways how people are hiding uh, this kind of equipment. And one of the vulnerabilities being addressed in January's critical patch update by Oracle fixes a directory traversal vulnerability in the Micros point of sale system. These are fairly popular point of sale systems, about 30,000 or so are out there in use. And according to Shodan, a small number of them is even exposed directly to the internet. Now, a directory traversal vulnerability isn't always really that bad. Really very much depends on what you have access to. The problem is in this case, you have access to a number of configuration files and such, including encrypted passwords and system logs. So it could pretty easily probably be escalated then into full system access. Microsystems have uh, had similar vulnerabilities in the past. They tend to be exploited pretty quickly by people who essentially just are scanning for these hosts or that also have already a foothold in some of these networks and are then attacking internal only reachable point of sale systems.
And well, we don't see a ton of fake antivirus these days, but what doesn't seem to go away are these various registry cleaners or system optimization packages that are being sold. And uh, well, uh, typically they are of somewhat dubious value. And even though they aren't typically outright malicious, uh, they're using a lot of the same techniques that fake antivirus uses in order to advertise themselves by, for example, pointing out that you have some bad registry entries on your Mac for all matters, or you have some non-existing malware on your system. Microsoft is now trying to clamp down a little bit on these systems. Starting March 1st, Windows Defender will start to actively flag these products and warn users of products that are displaying these deceptive advertisements. Microsoft just updated their definition of what they're flagging here as unwanted behavior or malicious, and they're calling this coercive messaging. In the past, other anti-malware products have done similar things. Uh, this typically has led to some rather high profile lawsuits where some of the manufacturers of these products uh, call these warnings unjustified, uh, but in a couple of cases, and I think that was actually also Mac Cleaner, a very similar product that's being sold for the Mac, where the Federal Trade Commission sued the manufacturer and caused them to have to refund a lot of the money they made by selling this product. The product, I think, still hasn't actually gone away. Well, that's it for today. And by the way, if you participated in the Raspberry Pi challenge during January, you should receive an email from me today, tomorrow, whenever I get around to it. I'll send emails to everybody that participated and uh, then I set up a little system uh, where you can sort of uh, claim your price. So thanks everybody for participating. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.